Hello and welcome back to Unheard. In the past day, Iranian strikes on Israel, repelled in part by British and American forces, once again shows just how close to a wider conflict we might be headed. But the politics of support for Israel are changing and fast. The American right, traditionally Israel's most rock-solid defenders, are now divided. The war since the 7th of October seems to have surfaced deep philosophical divisions. It's leading, you could say, to an ideological civil war. So in order to understand what might happen next, we really need to understand this underlying battle of ideas. Happily, we have the perfect person to help explain it to us. Saurabh Armari is a founder and editor at Compact Magazine, writes a fortnightly column on US politics for the New Statesman. He himself is considered a leading thinker on the American New Right. He's been observing his fellow travelers and erstwhile colleagues and seems to be quite worried by some of what he's seeing. Welcome to the show, Saurabh. Good to be back, Freddie. So I know, first of all, that you've just come back from a big debate hosted by the Free Press about immigration in Texas. And I feel like we should do a plug for our own debate. In a few weeks' time, we will both be in New York, in Brooklyn, debating the question of liberalism. So if anyone wants to come to that and check it out, I think there are still some tickets. I think, is it May the 3rd? It's May the 3rd, and I'll be on my side as the kind of liberalism critical side. It'll be me and Mary Harrington, I believe, and on your side, you and Nick Gillespie, who is also one of my opponents in the Dallas uh, immigration debate. So Nick and I have become a, a roadshow. And I suspect I have quite a different set of views to Nick, but it is going to be fun to explore that. Let's get, let's get to the topic. First of all, the events overnight and in the past 24 hours. This isn't just a battle of ideas online. This is very much a real world conflict and how much support Israel gets, whether it, Israel succeeds in getting more and more support from the US really is important for the whole world. Yes. So, I mean, I think for the most part, the mainstream of the Republican Party will continue to be um, rock solid pro-Israel. Um, it, it, there may be variations in tone from like a very, very hawkish anti-Iran figure like Senator Tom Cotton uh, to others. But regardless, I think that's going to be the mainstream of the of the party. There is a grave danger, as you said, of this thing escalating into a wider regional conflagration, um, a, a proper Iranian-Israeli war. And I think there is um, a, a, a great... Um, worry about the U.S. being then drawn into that. So I, my personal hope is that cooler heads are prevailing and um, certainly what the Biden administration is trying to do is to de-escalate. It's already striking though, isn't it, how the sort of left-right uh, politics of this are very different to previous Israel moments. I mean, you might think stereotypically that it would be the kind of hardliners on the right who are egging on a more of a conflict, maybe they want strikes on Iran, maybe they use this as an opportunity to get there and they would be more in line with Netanyahu, whilst you would expect the left to be against it and warning about it. And yet, apparently I'm reading here, NBC News reports in the past day that President Biden has privately expressed concern that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is trying to drag the US more deeply into a border conflict. And then you get those concerns amplified by overt Trump supporters on the right. So it's sort of confusing. One of the um, big disagreements between what is broadly called the new right, and it's this um, sort of loose coalition of different types. Some of them are you might, what, what we used to call paleo-conservatives. Uh, these are uh, conservatives who were always opposed to the kind of neoconservative hawkish turn, especially in American foreign policy, but they were often, um, their voices were relatively muted, they were kind of marginal, and now they've made a comeback. Some of them are nationalists who are um, very hawkish in, in, a, in one sense, that is, they, they want the United States to remain the preeminent power in the world. Um, but they've soured on regime change projects uh, the kind of the kind that the U.S. mounted after the kind of immediate post 9-11 era. Um, and they want, for example, the United States to focus its energies on the Pacific, where they see um, 
the real major rivalry uh, that's going to unfold in the 21st century that matters and less so in the Middle East and in the kind of NATO theater. I probably put myself somewhere in that camp personally for what it's worth. Um, and so and, and then there are others who are um, straight up American isolationists. There's a sort of old old fashioned, um, very, very old uh, trend in American thought, which says that, hey, we are a an enormous continental nation separated by two oceans. We have our own enormous domestic bounty of energy and natural resources. So there's no need for us to get entangled in anything abroad. So wh why are we doing that? But so right now, I mean, that's the history. But right now, events like we've seen in the past 24 hours, they land in a very different political setting. There are, as you describe it, all of these different factions, there is no such thing as American conservatives as a big lump that are just going to certainly support escalation or be there for Israel. So the whole outcome of this war in, might kind of depend on which of those factions ends up being dominant. Yes. And again, to be clear, I think as far as the Republican Party that is in, you know, in Congress right now, it is still overwhelmingly, you know, pro-Israel, and I think uh, on, on the foreign policy side is uh, is hawkish. I, now, there's one other word we haven't mentioned at all, which is the T word, the Trump word. To my mind, there was a kind of in his rise to first becoming the Republican nominee in 2016, and then his, you know, ultimately winning the election. Um, the, the key moment was. One of the key moments was when, in a, in a debate in South Carolina, he just said the Iraq war was a disaster. And now, you know, a lot of us, I was, I was then a kind of conventional hawkish editorial writer, you know, a leader writer for the, the Wall Street Journal, and then like a gasp went out, of, uh, went out of me, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues, I know for a lot of my colleagues. But what Trump had done is actually just voiced something that lots of American people, ordinary people, especially military families, knew to be true. Um, so it's like it was this forbidden thing that we couldn't voice because we were on the right and the George W. Bush administration had mounted the um, Iraq project. And suddenly Trump comes along and says it. Um, um, so that that wariness of, of more kind of what we call regime change wars or forever wars um, is one of the key elements of of the new right um, yeah, that you're seeing play out. In recent years, the last couple of years in particular, Ukraine has really been the petri dish for these ideas. And you've seen really quite influential voices on the right question the US's support for Ukrainian resistance to the Russian invasion. Uh, that began again as a slightly heretical idea, but it feels like it's really gained momentum. You get influential people like David Sachs and Elon Musk, who belong to a, another strand, I would say, not quite the, the new right, but it's a, it's a different creature. But they are definitely skeptical about entanglements like Ukraine. And that that's different from the sort of J.D. Vance new right, which is more of a kind of intellectual Trump supporter. Um, Ukraine has been was the the big topic until October the seventh for this discussion, wasn't it? Absolutely. So those the, those are all vaguely those figures that you named are all vaguely again sort of lumped together as part of the of a new right. But you're right that you know what Elon Musk or David Sachs represents is really a kind of techno libertarian techno libertarianism. That is, they um, are very sort of tech forward, believe in. Um, you know, a, a, a world of constant change and innovation, and they just they see these wars as as a counterproductive to that kind of thing. It's different from the more like J.D. Vance, uh, who who I consider a friend, I should say, who's more of a kind of solidaristic. Um, you know, this these kinds of wars does don't serve working class people. Where where whom he represents in, in in the Senate, he's from Ohio. He himself is from a kind of famously working class background. Um, and so yes, they come from different angles on it, but they converge because um, precisely because I think a, a lot of them see uh, Ukraine as an as a clear case of the United States. Um, you know, as something that was that came about as a result of the United States needlessly um, 
provoking Russia in the, in the immediate post-Cold War era of kind of NATO expansion beyond what was um, It's what the, was John, the John Mearsheimer view. We've had him on the show a few times. Yes, yes. Uh, and so so for, for, for those reasons, um, and because they're worried about, I think, rightly, I, to be clear, I, I share the kind of Sachs, J.D. Vance, <laughs> Elon Musk, that uh, y you don't want a war between two nuclear armed great powers and, and that, you know, Ukraine is not a core element of um, U.S. national security. We don't have a core interest in you uh, there. Maybe it's a European problem and we want to see maybe more European independence uh, around it. And on that topic, you got this additional group, I would say symbolized by people like Elbridge Colby, who we also had on the show, who are, you might call them hawkish, actually. They're kind of hawks in the sense that they really want to amp up resistance to China and start deploying military assets and basically getting ready for a war with China. That is their complete obsession. But they're just not really interested in Europe and Ukraine. So there's this coalition of these different groups. Um, and then you add in the figure of Donald Trump. I don't know which way exactly he goes on this, but he's definitely interested by some of these ideas. Do you think added up all together in sum, that now represents a dominant force on the American right? Resistance to more wars, skepticism about foreign entanglements. It just, it just depends on what you think of dominance. If you think of dominance as like, ref, you know, reflecting the popular base sentiment of ordinary GOP vo voters, yes, these various tendencies that you described, whether they emphasize, you know, oh, we want to step away from Ukraine because we want to focus on China, or whether they're more kind of more straightforwardly isolationist, um, or some mix of these various tendencies that we've just been talking about, insofar as those various intellectual tendencies represent the sort of base sentiments of ordinary Republican voters who are increasingly w working class, working lower middle class, which is a kind of complete dealignment from where the parties historically used to be. It used to be the Democrats who represented people like that. Um, then yes, these new trends are dominant. but. That's where Strange. the energy is, you'd say. I mean, that's, that's where the energy is. But it, w in terms of like humdrum ordinary power in Washington, um, I think that the most, b besides figures like J.D. Vance and a few others, um, still the dominant force in the Republican Party is conventional hawkism that is scarcely distinguishable from what the Biden administration's positions have been. If anything, it's more hawkish. Before we start talking properly about Israel, I just want to ask one more thing, which is, the left. But is the center left, if that's what we're, we're, where we're going to put Joe Biden, now more hawkish than these strains of the right? And, and is he held to account by a kind of proper left that remains anti-war? I mean, I'm thinking of the kind of Glenn, Glenn Greenwald type of left winger, who also is pretty influential. How, how much do they figure in this equation, do you think? Well, I mean, as if you just examine Ukraine, um, the degree of unanimity uh, on the left in favor of escalation was was shocking, considering that left parties uh, and left left movements in the United States and and in Europe as well are historically associated with um, being anti-war. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know. Uh, so at some point into the Ukraine war, or a few more months into the Ukraine war, after the United States had already done a kind of a tremendous amount of military aid, um, half of the marshal, the equivalent of the ha half of the Mar Marshall Plan already, um, you know, in, in inflation adjusted dollars had been poured into Ukraine. Um, this small group of progressives, uh, the, the House progressives, wrote a letter saying we should continue to support Ukraine. We're all for continuing to arm Ukraine. But, you know, maybe it's OK to try to explore negotiated settlements or open diplomatic channels. And it was shut down by the sort of majority of the Democratic Party. And I'm saying, including by Senator Bernie Sanders, who said this letter is, you know, inappropriate right now, um, so that they retracted their letter. Um, so for the past two years, especially since the since the invasion of Ukraine, we've all been looking to see where the anti where had the anti-war left gone. I mean, it was just you know when you had the self the sole sort of um, 
self-proclaimed socialist in the United States Senate, Senator Bernie Sanders being as hawkish as like Bill Kristol, um, you, you really thought that the, the anti-war left had, had completely been sort of demolished or absorbed into sort of mainstream democratic um, thinking and channels. However, I think that now, especially since October 7th, and then uh, with, with Israel's response being as harsh as, as many people say it has been, and now with the risk of a kind of potential war with Iran, you do see that kind of uh, anti-war left asserting itself more and more, and to a degree that worries the, the Biden administration about their prospects for re-election, you know, whether, you know, there are for example, Muslim American pockets in states like Michigan, there are there is great disaffection among young people. Uh, young people on the left are much less sympathetic to to Israel than older cohorts, and so they and the Biden administration needs to turn out young people. So if they merely stay home because they're um, dissatisfied with what's happening in Gaza or angry about what's happening in Gaza, that would be devastating to to Biden. So I do think. Um, the anti-war left uh, is sort of coming back, yes. Let's talk about that. So October the 7th happened. How did this affect these discussions on the right then? Because it feels like, I mean, let's take, for example, the Candace Owens, Ben Shapiro fallout. That's at the, the sharp end of this. It's happened in recent weeks. How did we get from October the 7th to there. Initially, when October 7th happened, for the most part, people on the right, including myself, said, my God, this is horrible. Um, Israel has a right and a duty to defend itself. Uh, that it's understandable that the Israelis uh, cannot tolerate living next to a Hamas that is both willing and capable to, to carry out such, a, such atrocities. Um, uh, but you know, over time, as the especially as the kind of risk of a wider escalation mm, uh, mounted, uh, and that would potentially bring the U.S. into the, into a kind of direct conflict with with uh, Hamas and its backers in Tehran and the kind of entire Iranian axis of so-called axis of resistance. I think there's dissent being there has been strong dissent being voiced uh, on the uh, including on the right by figures like. Uh, like you mentioned, Tucker Carlson, uh, Candace Owens, and so on. Um, in the case of Candace Owens, uh, some of her rhetoric has veered into what I, I, I consider anti-Semitic, right? Where she constantly refers to, you know, rabbis whom she's uh, critiquing as filth. Um, you know, it's 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 it, it, there's actually a, you know there is a strand, a minority stand to be sure of of uh, you know. African American anti-Semitism, right? That was associated with like Al Sharpton at the in the late '90s and early uh, late '80s and early '90s. You know, that led to the, like the Crown Heights riots and so on. This is kind of local New York history, but it's kind of national history as well. And Kanye I find, West, I find, arguably, you know, of course, there's Kanye West is a reflective of that as well. So I think. Um, on some elements of the right and influential ones that have enormous audiences, what I would consider legitimate criticism of is of the Israeli government, which oh, both of the Israeli government and whether or not this government, the Netanyahu government, deserves the degree of support that the U.S. government has lent it. That's a perfectly legitimate set of questions. Um, but along with that, um, you know, with this ability to voice things that hitherto had been kind of forbidden. There's a sense of like lifting a carpet, and there's all sorts of creepy crawlies there as well, and that the legitimate criticism has been um, blended in with some some really really toxic uh, rhetoric and memes. If you're on Twitter, um, which is what I wrote about in the New Statesman, this column is like I constantly in my normal Twitter feed see like really overtly racist or anti-Semitic memes, and somehow the algorithm. Not only promotes them, but they they, they typically have like ten thousand retweets and a hundred thousand likes, and it's like, it'll be like uh, you know a picture of a like a nineteen thirties uh, caricature, anti Semitic caricature, a German anti Semitic car caricature from the nineteen thirties of a rotund Jewish man sitting atop a big bag of gelt money, you know, and then next to it will be a picture of Representative Gerald Nadler, who's a member of Congress, actually from where I live, from New York, 
who is, of course, he's Jewish, and he's famously rotund, and he's sitting in the same posture. And the, those two pictures will be juxtaposed, and it'll get like 500 retweets and 5,000 likes, you know, things like that. You, you mentioned another couple of examples. It's quite interesting just to sketch them out. Um, you mentioned a, another account called I Am Yes You Are No is the, is the name, and they posted a meme saying, quote, you are witnessing the biggest act of cuckoldry in human history, an entire civilization willingly giving away its land and women. And Elon Musk quoted that post and added accurate after it. Apparently he's since deleted that. That seems to be sort of immigration inflected. And so, again, to be very clear, um, you know, I just did a debate in Dallas with a free press uh, in which I was on the side calling for shutting down the border. I believe that for um, mainly for economic reasons, because flooding our country, which is the most advanced economy in the world, with low wage labor does not make sense unless it's about uh, undercutting the wages of, of unskilled uh, workers in the United States, non-college workers. Um, it's a bad idea. It also has national security threats because a lot of people who are coming over in huge numbers are not vetted and so on. However, this language of cuckoldry and giving away your women uh, or these memes, I don't know, you've seen there's like a British versions of this where they've used AI generated images in which a British woman, you know, wrapped in the Union Jack, Jack and is surrounded by these basically black Arab men, brown and black men, sort of cruelly laughing at her and she's sort of crying and holding on to her. It's actually a pillow, a Union Jack pillow, which makes sense, doesn't make sense why she have a pillow when she's on the tube. But anyway, um, and it gets a gazillion thousand views uh, and, 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 and retweets. And sometimes Elon Musk will be like, you have said the truth. Like, <laughs> there's something uh, unsavory going on there. What exactly is going on there? So let's just try and break it down because it is hard, like in the Israel example, you yourself are skeptical about the conflict escalating. As you said, it's completely legitimate position to be anxious about that. It's also, I guess, legitimate to worry that Netanyahu is trying to bring the US in to a wider regional conflict. As the, Bi as the Biden administration has warned. In other words, it's, it's within, the, within the realm of legitimate opinion to say that there's, you know, there's nothing inherently anti-Semitic about that. Is it then anti-Semitic to then worry that there is a conspiracy of Jewish activists, uh, extremely highly funded, uh, the Israel lobby, as it is normally known, using their very great levers of power inside America to try and push the authorities towards a more trenchantly pro-Israel stance? I've always been skeptical of the sort of Israel lobby um, theories. I think the reason the Israel lobby is powerful is because, at least in the past, historically, the American people were overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Um, you know, when uh, when the state of Israel was founded, President Truman immediately, you know, uh, uh, recognized the new state of Israel, um, and. You know, broad majorities of the American people have this uh, sympathy for for the Jewish people. It's partly kind of, it's partly religious. Their um, you know their affinity for 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 their Christian affinity for the Jewish people. It's partly kind of uh, a recognition of after the horrors of the Holocaust um, that uh, it makes sense. In fact, it's eminently necessary t for the Jews to have their own sovereign homeland where they they can defend themselves with an defensible borders um, and all of that and I, I, I actually share of that I mean I can and, and as far as that baseline level you know I, I'm, I'm personally you know a Zionist I, I believe in the in the necessity and the justice of a, uh, of, a of a Jewish homeland um, and that's what that's the primary force I think that's driven uh, American sympathy for Israel and not you know uh, pro-israel lobbying not that there isn't pro-Israel lobbying, but every every interest group in Washington, like there's pro-Azerbaijani lobbying, which I find much more unsavory in some ways, to be honest. I suspect the Azerbaijani funding is less, though. I mean, this is where it's difficult because there is a, obviously there is a big Israel lobby. Um, and it probably is one of the better funded lobbying organizations. And there are lots of powerful Jewish people and all of the rest of it. 
So somehow you need to be able to observe that and not be accused of anti-Semitism for observing that. And yet, in your view, people like Candace Owens have, have somehow crossed the line because what their choice of language, the sort of memes start feeling to you that they are actually animated by something racial. Is that really what we're talking about? I think in, when, in the, we have to be historical about things, you know, in other words, uh, how we talk about an issue does not take place in a vacuum, you know, in a, in a context in which since the rise of modern anti-Semitism, um, you know, kind of in the, in the 19th century, in 19th century Europe, and then in its culmination in the, in the Holocaust, you know, yes, there is an extra burden on people who want to criticize uh, pro-Israel influence not to, you know, uh, to, be, to be careful about, you know, conflating, for example, pro-Israel influence and what the policy positions are and saying, I totally disagree with this. I believe this is not in our national interest and so on. And I think that it is, it is I think that you know, the, the, the influence of the pro-Israel lobby leads to bad policies. It's one thing. It's a quite another thing to, set, to, to talk about, uh, you know, Jewish filth you know, and, and these kinds of mimetic kind of rage that I see vented, uh, especially on social media. Um, and that that's the problem, right? In other words, you have to be historically aware that, um, you know, claims about kind of malign hidden Jewish power have in the past led to some really horrific outcomes that we don't want to see repeated. And you think it is coming back. I mean, that is what is, I suppose, surprising to me because I have not witnessed it so much, but then I maybe don't spend the time on the same channels. I suppose you're talking about people like Nick Fuentes, the young, very kind of right-wing provocateur uh, activist on Twitter, people like that, who are moving into overtly anti-Semitic territory. And what you're observing is for the first time in quite a long time, there are genuinely influential parts of the right that are pretty overtly anti-Semitic. Even within that, there are different uh, strands of it. So uh, there's there's the kind of Fuentes, which um, is sort of like, uh, it's it, he, he considers himself a Catholic and um, is a kind of, uh, you know, I mean, he's overtly you know, he'll talk about Jews, the Jews as, as a problem and so on, but it's within like kind of a, a kind of thuggish Christian kind of frame. And then there are these um, other tendencies which are more kind of a, a Nietzschean. Uh, they they uh, are kind of neo-pagan tendencies you see online on the right um, who are concerned with um, what they call, for example, human biodiversity, you know, they, they believe that there are large between there are differences between large human groups that are that are delineated by IQ differences, and that the dysgenic black and brown hordes are sort of overwhelming um, the heroic high IQ figures who otherwise society should celebrate and champion. It's a kind of disproportionate, and even on that one, you know, the, the liberal in me wants to allow people to ask academic questions about IQ differences uh, if it's useful and if we are interested in the truth, but a sort of disproportionate obsession with that trying to prove that basically some races are cleverer than others, which is where you think they want to reach, is different. Is, is how, do we, what, how do we draw the line in that example? What they'll say is like, look at the, the, look at the white IQ you know, or crime rate versus the black. The problem is like white is a completely arbitrary, in some ways a completely arbitrary category invented by, you know, American bureaucrats, right? Like there is the appearance of like whiteness, but then the degree to which, you know, you put a Greek American and a Scandinavian American or whatever into that, there's all sorts of variations in that. So to speak of capital W white or capital uh, B black is um, is kind of nonsensical. Uh, the, 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 so the categories that they use to, uh, to sort of track these kind of long, uh, long-term trends or so on, uh, themselves are creations of social policy, not 
and, 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 and of a kind of a social bureaucracy and not something that's built into nature at a deep level. Okay, let me put a challenge to you, Saurabh, which I think we need to address, which is to what extent are people like yourself and maybe even myself culpable in having helped to unleash these forces? You know, you began your life in Iran. We all know what happened in 79. There was an original revolution, which was a, a sort of led by students and intellectuals. And very shortly after it came the revolution that still dominates today. And the original revolutionaries are like, oh no, what have I done? This wasn't the plan. And the really rough, the worst tendencies actually were, were finally successful. Can we make an analogy here, which is there has been this revolution of ideas in the past few years with Trump at the center of it, which is let's break the taboos. Let's say out loud those more primal intuitions we have and let's give them intellectual credence about difficult topics like immigration, about not being sort of trying to be neutral. Let's just, let's say it how it is. And there's a kind of intellectual version of that, which I think you represent. And some of these kids have now just going way further and you are now aghast at the demons that you have helped to unleash. What do you say to that? No, I, I, I don't buy that because uh, you know, the strand of critique of li philosophical liberalism I've always represented is solidly grounded in Catholic thought in uh, sort of the tradition of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and uh, it has, for me, I mean, it, going back to when I launched a series of kind of polemics against liberal ideology and so on, uh, that always went hand in hand with a revulsion for essentially kind of the Nietzschean worship of strength, uh, you know, of this kind of uh, uh, overman ideology, because these are, these are, of course, not, there's a very, those are very anti-Catholic ideas. Often they're also, the reason they're anti-Semitic anti, uh, anti is also a, 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 it's a revulsion for Christianity. Why? Because in their theories, um, Christianity was somehow the universalization of the Jewish ethic. The Jewish ethic being the ethic of the weak and the sort of, uh, you know, the people who can't, uh, they're not uh, virile enough, they're not strong enough on their own, like the kind of heroic pagan character. So they have to invent an ideology that celebrates weakness and that in Christianity this idea invades or infiltrates the uh, the, 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 the sort of the wider Gentile world. Um, and, you know, the, these ideas, I've always been clear that I really hate them. <laughs> In other words, there's a, there's a kind of godly version of this, which doesn't lead to these dark places. But I suppose the challenge has to be that the figure of Donald Trump, around whom many of these ideas have been circulating, and you've been sometimes tolerant, sometimes supportive, sometimes critical of Trump, but it's quite, very hard to think of him as a godly figure. It's very hard to think of him as someone who champions the weak against the strong. He's very Nietzschean, he's very much power will win, I will bully everyone out of, of in my way if they, if they cause me trouble. And so these little creatures that you're describing on the online right are, I would say, pretty obviously taking inspiration from Trump because they see he talks in this kind of rough way about brute strength, He's, he crosses all the taboos, and they're just going to do that, but even more so. And they're finding success. They're basically copying Trump. I mean, how do we understand the figure of Trump in this discussion? There is an element of American populist uh, politics that he represents that goes back, for example, to, the, to a figure like uh, Andrew Jackson, which is which is gruff, which is rough. It has a cult of personality element to it, but also has this kind of, you know, egalitarian, in, it's in a kind of low church, you know, egalitarian uh, mentality against elites, right? And um, in that sense, uh, it clearly has has uh, resonated not just with not just with white working class people, um, uh, but with uh, with uh, uh, so you, so you're black saying minorities as well. He's not so, racist, is what you're saying. Trump is many things, but you don't think he's racist. 
I mean, I, th I think he has said things that, uh, I, as I've written, that make my skin crawl, right? When he, for example, describes entire countries as shithole countries or what have you. Um, but, I mean, in terms of his inner heart, you can't read it. But I, I think in terms of his movement, um, it is it has proved not to be as liberals characterized it as a kind of movement of just pure white resentment. Um, there was a book here recently called White Rural Rage that appeared in the United States, it became a bestseller, but it came under enormous scrutiny because its claim was that rural Americans are kind of uniquely kind of racist and anti-democratic and so on. And it was picked apart, including by me and the New Statesman, but also lots of progressive scholars of rural America who pointed out that actually, you know, rural Americans are not especially uh, you know, nasty in the way that they are portrayed to be. And that's, I think, where the Trumpian backcountry base is. Now, let me just make this one point that among the kind of professional classes and intellectuals of the right, which is different from the voting base of the Trump movement, um, there is a subset of disaffected, urban educated people, the kind of some of, some of them are precarious, some of them are financially secure, but it's they who I believe, just from my own kind of anecdotal studies of who it is that's kind of promoting the kind of racial ideology that I was, overtly racial ideologies that I was talking about, um, it's they who are kind of uh, promoting this and they, they don't have actually much overlap with the kind of backcountry MAGA. So you think basically the more upscale urban Trump supporters are the more un race racially dubious ones. Y yes, and they're, they're, I mean, uh, you know, for them, like, even Trump is a, uh, it, they happen to support him maybe for their own reasons, um, but they have a completely different, uh, they don't have that egalitarian anti-elite vision of sort of street populism, mega populism, because they believe that it's elites, you know, kind of heroic Nietzschean elites who should be kind of genetic superiors who should be unleashed and that democracy as such, small d democracy, kind of holds the, the, the truly sort of eugenic among us back and it allows the claims of the dysgenic many to like overwhelm. So this is kind of more like elite radical ideology than it is like the ideology of MAGA. And last point to make, just, just because you mentioned immigration and so on, I mean, I think that um, if if mainstream forces, and if you think of maybe Trump as a mainstream force in some ways now after all this time and how he's doing in the polls, maybe he is, if they don't address the kind of legitimate concerns about immigration, uh, whether it has to do with social cohesion, whether it has to do with the wages of low-income people and so on, then I th you know, you will get the ugly solutions and the ugly rhetoric um, of, the, of this, this sector of the right. So to take us back to the beginning conveniently then, on something like Israel and how that has divided the right and how some of these more unsavory elements have really gathered traction. If anything, Trump is almost a, a bullock. He's almost a, a backstop to some of those tendencies because on a question like Israel, yes, he might be skeptical of wars. He might be very much inclined to bring things to an end and do a deal and put a stop to the thing. But I think it's hard to make the case that he's anti-Semitic. He's lived his whole life in New York, his uh, son-in-law is Jewish, you don't get, it's very hard to get the impression from Donald Trump that he doesn't like Jewish people. Yeah, it's, he's just like a kind of New York, uh, New York character um, who is hard to imagine as seething with anti-Jewish, anti-Jewish animus. Um, so, and you know, like, it, uh, it was interesting, you know, when he, as far as Ukraine was concerned, you know, his plan is uh, to bring peace. He's very good at reading the public too, you know. He's he's like, I'm gonna I'm gonna settle that in 24 hours. Now that sounds ludicrous to me, but maybe maybe he will. Who knows? Um, but also in like reading the mood with with like the Gaza operation. Um, in so far as he's a populist, it's because he can put his finger on the pulse. Which is a few few weeks ago, he said, "Well, they gotta wrap that up." Right. That's it, what, what he means by that is it getting ugly. OK, it's like you did your thing, baby, but like enough. <laughs> um, and that's that's I think that's a legitimate position. I think it reflects the mood of lots of people in the country. And it's kind of his. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I as a man himself, I don't see him as a force for um, 
kind of toxic ideologies. Final question, final, final question for you, Saurabh. Having said everything we said, do you still consider yourself part of the new right? I mean, insofar as among the e-right version of it, the online version of it, uh, you know, overt kind of Nietzschean strength, worship of strength or, you know, overt old school anti-Semitism has taken hold. I've been left behind by it. And it's funny because, there, you know, I've, as you know, I've, I've been quite critical of liberalism as such. And I don't mean just like center left. I mean liberalism as a kind of grounding philosophy of the West since the Enlightenment. What well, we're um, going to talk about in two weeks time. Yes. Um, and so, but as I've kind of been repelled and expressed revulsion at you know the rise of this kind of ideology which i i actually see in a way as like the you know in some ways and we'll get into it in the debate of like the end point of liberalism precisely because it atomizes people and removes kind of family community as these um, structures in which human beings are embedded and allows us to be social creatures people have to find community and a sense of belonging in other ways. So like race as a kind of capital R race as a, where you belong could be a sort of a, an end point or a side effect of liberalism. So insofar as new, the new right is going in this direction, I'm off the bus because it, it was never part of the program for me or what are the kinds of ideas that I put forward, I ha that I have put forward over the past five years. So Abamari, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Freddie. So you heard it there, Saurav Amari, one of the intellectual founders of the so-called New Right in the US, saying he is off the bus, it's gone to a place where he no longer feels comfortable. And I look forward to talking more with him in a couple of weeks. If you are able to make it, if you happen to be on the East Coast and within striking distance of New York City, come and join us and join the discussion yourself. May the 2nd to the 3rd, Dissident dialogues. We're going to put the link down there in the information. Thanks for tuning in. This was Unheard.